years of adaptions to resistance training. So we're talking about long-term changes thanks to lifting something that's heavier than what we're used to. This doesn't necessarily need to be a barbell, a dumbbell, a machine. It can be body weight um, and it can be cables. It can be anything that's effectively producing an overload. So we're gonna talk about how resistance training is going to get you gains in muscular fitness. What are the mechanisms for this? Obviously what's also causing soreness, excuse me, which will be related and how we're gonna do resistance training with a couple of different special populations, which is gonna be relatively brief. So why do we do resistance training? Because you get stronger. Now, a lot of the reason why you get stronger is neuromuscular changes, meaning you literally become better at using those individual muscles. Now, this is important for overall fitness and health because a stronger, more capable person is going to typically have a quali higher quality of life and higher functionality. And it's obviously gonna be really important for sports. Every sport has a strength component. The key is how much importance is there on that strength component. So the sport of powerlifting, strength is the only thing that matters. That's the big key. Now, when it comes to long distance running, well, you have to literally be physically strong enough to run. And that does require a certain amount of force production on each of your legs. So we still wanna make sure we're developing it, but we'll talk about you know, at what point are you effectively strong enough. Now, in our first three to six months of resistance training, we can possibly double our strength levels depending on how good our program is, how sedentary we were beforehand, and obviously our commitment on the program. Now, most of this change, the initial change is that neurological. We're literally getting better at the movements. We are doing a better job of producing force. And what we're going to see as the gains are gonna be similar as a percent of our initial strength. So if you're a younger individual, you're gonna have a greater amount than if you're older. Men tend to gain more strength than women. Children don't really gain a lot of strength. It's mostly neuromod, or they do gain strength, but it's mostly from neuromuscular changes, not actually increases in muscle mass. And this is thanks to what's known as muscle plasticity, which is our muscles can change thanks, upon, thanks to the stressors that we apply to them. Now you obviously need to apply enough stress and you need to apply the stress consistently long enough in an intelligent manner that you're going to get overload and you're going to get performance increases. So if we increase the size of a muscle, the muscle tends to be stronger. If we decrease the size of that muscle, the muscle tends to be weaker. However, it's a little bit more involved than that because we're still going to have the neuromuscular size to it. So our strength gains are really coming from, yeah, having a bigger muscle, but two, that we have a better ability to turn that muscle on so to recruit the fibers, to synchronize the contraction of the fibers, so we're going to be able to produce more force. Now we have below guys, is going to be the uh, world records at this point, or sorry, it would have been in the early teens of Olympic lifting when we're looking at the difference between men and women. And obviously guys have much heavier weight classes, which is one of the problems with the sport. But beyond that, Notice that the records for men in general is higher than it is for women. Why do you think the max strength numbers in Olympic lifting would be higher in men than it would be in women? Why do you guys think that would be? Would it be maybe because men usually have tend to have bigger bodies, so there's more, they're able to produce bigger muscles, potentially? It's not so much, it's not really coming down to the fact that men can produce, they, in general, men have more muscle mass than women. Why would that be? Yes, Braden, hormones. Average guy is going to have more testosterone than your average female. And testosterone definitely helps with increasing muscle mass. Now, overall, as far as the ability to increase muscle size, both genders have the ability to massively increase muscle size from being sedentary to highly trained. The key difference is with the addition of testosterone, that's where guys typically start ahead of women. And that's where it's really obvious whenever both genders go through puberty. Whereas guys, thanks to puberty, tend to be more athletic because of it. 
they increase their muscle mass and hence increase their performance. Whereas women, on the other hand, depending on how uh, puberty goes, um, so we obviously have a number of ladies here in the class. Let's just get, go ahead and do a quick poll of those of you guys here. Um, just yes or no, did puberty make you a better athlete for the female students in the class? So we only have one person responding. Oh, so, okay, so thank you. I was looking at the poll, not looking at the chat. Okay, yeah, turns out not really helping too much. So keep in mind, when we're looking at strength gains, they can occur without building muscle size. And that's part of the skill side of strength and conditioning, strength training. And this is thanks to our motor system. So that somatic nervous system. This is not just our muscles that are gonna be changing. Now, we're going to do this by increasing, increasing how much we're gonna recruit, how frequently we're gonna be uh, recruiting that, so it's known as rate coding, and then other neural factors, AKA synchronization and both inter and intra muscular coordination. Inter meaning from one muscle to another, they're all gonna time up and work together. Inter meaning all the fibers inside of that muscle working well together. So, Normally, we don't recruit our muscle fibers synchronously, meaning we're going to do them all at once. As we get to be better and better at lifting weights, we're going to synchronize. We're literally going to get all those fibers to contract at the same time. So the analogy I could give you guys is if every single one of us were effectively uh, pushing on an empty, I don't know, an empty tractor trailer. So just the, the trailer side of it. If we all just kind of pushed at once or pushed at our own time, you're not really going to rock it. But if we got everybody to push all together at the same time, you could definitely get it to start to sway. And if you had enough people, aka enough motor units with enough force production, cross-sectional area, you would eventually be able to put it on its side. So that's effectively how we're able to, or one of the properties of how we can increase our force production with that. Now, not only are you going to be doing a better job of recruiting these fibers, but now we're going to be able to send those signals faster and we're going to have less inhibitory or impulses. Meaning when we talk about the changes in the Golgi tendon organ, that's not going to be telling us to slow down as much. We're going to be able to give a greater percentage of our maximal ability. So it's going to be all of these things that are helping and especially when we're doing things like high speed movements. And that's why if you want to be fast, you should practice being fast. And hence why people do things like Olympic lifting, plyometric exercises, uh, medicine ball throws and otherwise as a way to help effectively get that nervous system to fire as quickly and as aggressively as possible to give you the greatest force production. Now, you normally have a certain amount of inhibition. Now, a lot of this is coming from the Golgi tendon organs because we don't want to produce too much force across the tendon the tendon can deal with, and then we can literally tear the tendon. As we train more and more, we're going to literally have less of this inhibition. That's part of the reason why I tore my pec is my nervous system didn't tell me to calm down when it obviously should have, because it would have, I wouldn't have gone to Snap City, but hindsight is 2020. The key is like anything else, you're taking the governor off the engine. And I know we've talked about the governor on the engine before in this class, this is one of those ways. Now, you're going to do a better job of turning on all of the muscles for the movement and making sure that our antagonists are not going to be turning on as much. So for example, when you're doing something like a skull crusher, the biceps is working to make sure that you're not going to be going too fast. And we're going to start to see some changes there. Now, morphology of the neuromuscular junction, meaning we're gonna have kind of a better surface contact and we're going to do a better job of turning over acetylcholine and get it to be received in the first place. Now, the next big thing is literally making muscles bigger. And that's what we refer to as hypertrophy. Now, there's the transient hypertrophy, which is effectively known as the pump. And that's a good indicator of whether or not you really train that muscle itself well. However, it's not going to be a perfect uh, correlation between chronic hypertrophy. And that's literally how much 
size increase in fibers you're going to get over time. Now, this is going to come mostly due to fiber hypertrophy, meaning the cross-sectional area of the individual fibers increases in size. So if you look at the picture on the right, you can literally see how those fibers are now bigger in diameter than when they started. Now, another thing that happens in humans, but it's relatively rare, is what's known as hyperplasia. And that's where you effectively split an individual muscle fiber into two individual fibers, and then those, in turn, can also increase in cross-sectional area. It definitely happens in animals, but you don't see this a whole lot in humans. Now, we're going to be able to maximize this by making sure we're doing eccentrics, and that's where we're going to be doing a lot of damaging or damage to our sarcomeres. Now, like anything else, the concentric, aka lifting it, is important because, well, it turns out that's still giving us a metabolic signal, which is another signal that's going to cause or help cause muscle growth, along with just the mechanical tension that we're going to be going through is another signaling pathway. So, like anything else, you want to make sure that you're applying stress, you're controlling the movement. And there's even some arguments about using slower eccentrics at certain points in training to really maximize muscle fiber innervation so that you're going to have a cleaner movement pattern, which in turn is in theory going to lead to more muscle growth. So hypertrophy is coming down to more myofibrils. And myofibrils we're talking about are those sarcomeres, which literally means more actin, myosin, titan, all of those different proteins involved in the basic contraction. We're going to be increasing the amount of sarcoplasm because we've got more enzymes related to glycolysis, maybe storing more glycogen, things along those lines. And we're going to increase the amount of connective tissue, fascia. We should be increasing the size of our tendons and otherwise so we can deal with a greater amount of force being produced through them. So the resistance training itself is going to cause a increase in muscles, muscle protein synthesis pathways and is going to cause an inhibition of muscle catabolism or degradation pathways. Now, while you're actually lifting, when you're exercising, you actually have less synthesis and more degradation. And it's when we're not training, that's where we have increased synthesis and less breakdown. So we should net more muscle hypertrophy. And testosterone is a pretty important thing for increasing hypertrophy. And if you're gonna go and ride the Roy Pony, you are going to massively increase or have the potential to massively increase your muscle mass over what you would possibly do without the use of the hormone testosterone. Now, both genders have testosterone. The key is it's obviously the amount in males, which is typically far higher than that in females, but both genders still have the ability to increase muscle mass with training. Now, this is that hyperplasia that I talked about earlier, where you can actually see literally how those fibers are going to split in half. They've shown this in cats, which is kind of funny, where they literally put them inside of a container where there was a lever they had to reach and push. And whenever they reached the lever and pushed it, it would drop food in there. So they would keep constantly reaching far and reaching far. And they found that it actually increased the fiber number in these cats. Now they've done the same thing with a lot of different animals. One of the bird models was interesting is they actually tied, not tied, they actually put a weight on their arm, which would be the equivalent of you guys effectively walking around with like a 50 pound dumbbell strapped to your arm for the entire day. And they did that for a couple of weeks, took it off, and they noticed that once again, they had hyperplasia, increased fiber number, which in turn is going to increase muscle size. Now, it's mostly going to be from cross-sectional area increases, hypertrophy, not hyperplasia. The only study I can think of that's a good like analogy, which is some MRI studies where they looked at uh, muscle or muscle size increases. And then they also compare that to biopsy cross-sectional area. And it could not be simply explained the amount of muscle they gain by simply increases in cross-sectional area. So hyperplasia probably occurs, but 95% or more of the time it's occurring thanks to our wonderful increase in cross-sectional area. So if it does happen, it's probably happening more in the type two fibers. So hence it's gonna happen thanks to really, really hard training. And you're going to have to have probably very, very heavy loads or super high speed impacts doing things like plyometrics. Now, another thing to keep in mind outside of the hyperplasia, which is something that naturally is going to occur, which is through activation and then binding of satellite cells to our muscle fibers. So when our fibers are damaged, thanks to training, we're going to have satellite cells, which effectively 
are like a stem cell for your muscles. They're going to fuse to those damaged muscle fibers, which is going to increase their mitochondrial number. And when this occurs, you're going to be able to literally turn over more protein faster, aka you have more factories, which in turn is going to give you a bigger muscle over time from cross-sectional area because you've got greater protein expression. This is the other big thing about A, doping, and B, long-term training effects, where thanks to all of this work where you've had this activation of satellite cells, where they're then going to go ahead proliferate, meaning number and cell, migrate, move, and then fuse to those fibers, you're never going to really lose those nuclei. It doesn't seem to happen from the human model and definitely not from the rodent model. So if you take a long layoff, you're going to find it's easier to get back to your previous levels of strength than it was to get to those levels in the first place because you're going to have a greater number of nuclei so you can literally turn over protein at a faster rate and rebuild those muscle fibers faster than it took you to build them in the first place. Now, this is why, thanks to being male, testosterone naturally activates these satellite cells. Hence why, for the guys here, whenever you hit puberty, you probably became a better athlete no matter what, because suddenly you had a lot more muscle mass, which were stronger, more powerful, once again, performing better overall. And that's why it's a very interesting conversation to have when it comes to the potential for trans athletes, because if you're a, a male that then transitions to being a female and you went through puberty, that's the big key. As a male, in theory, you have a satellite cell advantage, which means you, in theory, are almost going to always have a strength advantage and a muscle recovery advantage over a female that never had those levels of androgens. So it is something that's worth having a conversation about and not, you know, like you see normal conversations on the internet devolving into these days, meaning I don't want to get into a yelling fight and I don't think you guys do either. Does that make sense when it comes to these satellite cells and why they're important? Good. So my question to you guys is, do you think you'd be a better athlete if you had more or less satellite cells available to your muscles? Indeed, guys, because in theory, you're gonna be able to have greater turnover. One of the cooler things I saw, it was at ISSN, gosh, it was probably about four years ago, three, you know, three or four years ago where I got a chance to go there, where they, uh, there was research coming out of the military where they were showing that chart, uh, tart cherry juice actually helps activate uh, satellite cells to, in theory, help with muscle recovery because they were wondering why they weren't seeing actual changes in intramuscular signaling, but they were seeing an increase in muscle recovery. And it's probably because you're having this fusion occur, which it's kind of cool to think about. So our short-term changes in muscle strength, okay, is going to be due mostly to our neurological. The first effective two months of training to three months of training, nearly all of our increases in strength are going to come thanks to increased neurological control. It's after that initial 10 weeks that the major changes we're going to have in strength is going to occur thanks to increases in muscle mass. Now, that doesn't mean after the 10 weeks, you're no longer increasing your neurological activation. And before that, you're not increasing your muscle size. You're doing both of those, the previous stages. The key is how big of a factor are they and which one's giving you the majority of the change that's occurring. Because you guys have probably met people that have been lifting for years with bad technique and you fix their technique and you increase their strength again, significantly simply because we've literally just improved their neurological patterning. Now, as you figure, if you're going to stop training, you're going to lose muscle mass. Uh, immobilization studies, you can see a loss of muscle mass of, I mean, it can be as aggressive as uh, losing over 10% of muscle size per week, depending on what type of loss you're having. We've had folks get on the decks and otherwise that have lost 45 pounds of lean mass off of their surgery leg from doing or having to have an ACL reconstruction. So as you suspect, as soon as you start immobilizing, you're going to start to see some, you see lack of protein synthesis. There's no reason for the body to keep on more muscle than it needs to. Muscle is calorically expensive to maintain. 
So the body wants to have effectively as little of it as possible. And that's really obvious when you look at really anyone. Their body is only having as much muscle as it needs to to get through their activities of daily living. So hence why people that are typically have a life or a job that's very manually labor uh, intensive, you see a greater amount of muscle mass. Individuals that are more sedentary, you see a lesser amount of muscle mass. And yes, genetics are always going to be a factor here. And we're going to find is that not just the size is going to go backwards, but your strength is going to go backwards pretty rapidly also. Now, obviously, this is going to be relatively reversible. The thing that's interesting is your type 1 fibers are actually affected at a faster rate than your type 2. And the reasoning for that is the body is trying to maintain power output. So if you still have about the same amount of type 2 uh, fibers, you're not going to have good endurance. You're going to gas out pretty quick. But in theory, you're going to be able to sprint for a little bit. You're going to be able to jump. You're going to be able to do that little bit of fight for your life. But you're not going to be able to do long amounts or you're not going to be able to do large volumes, long uh, work bouts, because like anything else, there's no bioenergetic reason to maintain all that aerobic capacity. So. E-training, meaning at any point, you're not training as hard as you were before, you're probably going to go backwards in strength, plain and simple. Now, the key is if you want to go ahead and get stronger, you're going to have to make the training more severe than it was before, which gets to be obviously a lot more horrendous the further you go with training and the stronger you're going to get. Now, what we have here is just some changes in strength from doing 20 rep and six rep training protocols. It turns out when you're working with a novice, whether you're doing high reps or low reps, you're going to get stronger. The thing that's moderately terrifying is the idea of doing sets of 20 on the back squat. I notice guys, the values are in kilograms. So you got to multiply by 2.2 to get in the pounds. It's okay to not be impressed because the numbers aren't that great. And that's leg press. I'm not going to dignify that with a comment. And the same thing when we're trying to focus on single joint exercises like the leg extension. Now, this is what's really fascinating is notice whenever individuals are doing more high repetition work, they're going to seemingly have a greater amount of cross-sectional area increase in that type one muscle fiber. Whereas when they're doing lower repetition work, you see the greater amount of increase coming from those type 2A and then the hybrid 2A slash 2X fibers because Finding a true 2X fiber is relatively rare in most trained individuals. So what's really cool with your fiber types is thanks to training, you're going to see your type two fibers start to pick up more oxidative and aerobic capacities. And your type ones can also become a little bit better with anaerobic performance, depending on the type of training you're doing. The body is trying to get as good as it can to whatever you're doing. So you're going to see also a certain amount of conversions. Remember, as we talked about those hybrid fibers, those 2A slash 1 converting more to 1 if we're doing a lot of aerobic work, converting more to 2A if we're doing a lot of more strength power work. And so there's different studies where they've changed innovation of muscle. They've gone and stimulated the muscle with electricity for effectively to mimic a slow twitch fiber where you're going to see those type of conversions. And the same thing whenever they're doing sprint studies. And the funny thing is the fastest way to increase your amount of type two fiber is actually be as sedentary as possible and then do some like sprint high power work on occasion. So the most consistent or most typical one is your 2X to 2A simply because the, your 2X are effectively your couch potato fibers. They don't, there's very few people that have naturally high amounts of pure type 2X. And if they do, they're probably named Usain Bolt or they're people that race against him. And what we're going to find is from risk heavy training, this is more Steren's work, where the first thing you're going to see is a decrease in 2X and an increase in 2A when it comes to fibers, while you're also increasing your overall cross-sectional area of the muscle. Now, you can see a little bit of conversion from 1 to 2A. That's relatively rare, but that is something new that can occur. And remember, we're meant to be generalists. We're meant to be about 50% slow twitch, 50% fast twitch. So thanks to exercise, thanks to working, you're going to find yourself eventually becoming more and more specific to what your goals are. That does not mean that you're going to exactly match what the body happened or what you would expect, because we all are born with a certain fiber makeup and training can obviously influence it, but genetics alone account for about 50% of your fiber type variability. So you got done doing hard training. What's the first thing that's, or what's going to happen? 
you're going to be sore. Now, if it's immediately during and or immediately after exercise, it is caused by something very differently than what's known as delayed onset muscle soreness, which can occur from 24 to even 72 hours later. Now, here's the thing. Muscle soreness is going to be a pretty good indicator that you obviously train that muscle, specifically the delayed onset. The causes of acute muscle soreness are very different than the delayed onset muscle soreness. If any of you ever writes down the cause of delayed onset muscle soreness is lactate, you'll re receive a zero on that question and every other question on that exam, because that is so horribly wrong I don't feel comfortable with you passing exercise physiology and saying that to anyone ever. Now, why do you guys think that lactate is not a cause of soreness the next day? Absolutely true, John. The body uses it for energy. What else? Doesn't uh, it just like kind of, yeah, return after exercise? I was going to say, doesn't it deplete a little bit? So eventually, yes, both what Braden and you were saying there, Zach, which is your body is effectively going to clear that lactate. If your body has not cleared the lactate, okay, has not removed the lactate from that area, much less from your bloodstream 24, 48 hours later, that part of your body is still anaerobic. If that part of your body has been anaerobic for a full day, for a full day, what do you think is going to happen to the to that tissue? Would it erupt? Tear? No, probably not erupt. Probably not tear. Think of it this way. Go ahead. Don't for the love of God, don't do this, but we'll just have a thought exercise. We're going to have you guys make your left arm, left leg, whatever you guys want, whichever your non-dominant one is, the one that can be sacrificial. We're going to have you make that leg go anaerobic for the next um, 24 hours. So you're going to put a tourniquet on your limb so tight that no blood flow can go to and from that limb. Yes, exact. Good job, Haley and Jalen. Exactly. That is going to rot and die and fall off. So if you still have all of those metabolic byproducts that haven't been cleared 24 hours later, it's because you're not getting blood flow to that area. And that's because your leg is probably no longer a part of you and it's somewhere fallen off. Does that make sense, guys? It's very important you understand that. Awesome. So immediately after training, you do have the greater amounts of lactate in your bloodstream, which is going to give you a greater amount of protons. So your pH is going to be going down. So you get that burning sensation. You've got edema through all the vasodilatory factors around that muscle. So you're going to be effectively pumped up edema in that area. Now, this is going to go away. And think about like the best pump you guys had in your entire life from lifting. It probably only stayed with you for maybe half an hour, maybe an hour tops. And like anything else, once that's gone, you should be back to normal. If your tissue is still hurting, you probably strained it or sprained it. And you've got some, not just micro trauma, but you're talking about macro trauma to the tissue. Now, what we're really talking about from training is what's known as delayed onset muscle soreness, which is going to occur typically one to two days after you've exercised. And this is mostly occurring in type one muscles. And this is literally due to lots of damage. So if you ever wanna feel a crazy amount of soreness, do just downhill, downhill hill running, do that for half an hour. This is not due to blood lactate. This is due to all this damage, which is caused Z-line streaming. The Z-line streaming, which in turn has caused damage to your muscle cell membrane is leaking a lot of potassium. This potassium is causing your uh, nociceptors, your pain receptors effectively in those areas to fire. And I'm sure every single one of you guys has been as I like to refer to it, Tyrannosaurus wrecked at least once in your life, thanks to doing really hard training. In fact, how many of you folks have had that where you did like a hard squat workout or deadlift workout, you got up the next morning and you're like, oh, 
actually, I feel fine. Nothing hurts. Everything's okay. Like maybe I got away clean. And then maybe later on that day, maybe the next day, it's usually after you've like sat still for a couple hours and you stand up and it's just like you got shot by the sniper. Like you nearly fall back down because of the pain going through your legs. How many of you guys have had that experience? Indeed. So does that make sense now what's causing it? Now, this damage, you're actually going to be able to look at in your bloodstream. So you're literally going to see increases in what's known as the enzyme creatine kinase. That is a good marker of muscle damage. In fact, when people have things like rhabdomyolysis, their creatine kinase levels are off the charts. You can also have elevation of ALT and AST, which are both enzymes related to the functioning of your liver. So if you're doing a lot of hard training, you should probably try to take a couple days off before you get blood work done to effectively see what's going on in your bloodstream so that you're not getting a false positive for having really high levels, though you're actually just, you know, you're a little tired and sore from training, but nothing too bad. So remember guys, the Z discs are the ends of the sarcomeres where they're matching up. So we have what's literally known as Z line streaming. When we're pulling the sarcomeres together, those Z discs are both being pulled from each direction. And the pulling effectively is going to cause literal damage to it. And so, like I said, because of this damage, we're going to have a little bit of leakage, which in turn is going to cause soreness. But the good news is, is this the same type of causing or causation that is going to give you the signaling to increase muscle mass. Now, keep in mind, like anything else, this is what's known as a hermetic stressor. Have we talked about hermetic stressors yet in this class, guys? We talked about hermetic stressors. Okay, thank you. Hermetic stressors are very important to understand in that there are a number of things in life that a little bit of stress from it is actually a good thing for your overall performance and health. Now, too much of it is a bad thing. So, for example, you think about in the summer, if you go out in the sun, if you go out in the sun for just long enough and then you go back inside, what is the positive effect that's going to occur you know, to your body from having that much sun exposure? What is the positive effect that's going to occur from that much sun exposure? Vitamin D production. Yes, what else? Aside from vitamin D, uh, vitamin D production, what else are you going to get from being out in the sun, guys? Yes, a tan, which is actually a good thing because you're literally building up your own tolerance to a greater amount of sun exposure. Now, what happens if you stay out there too long, Tyler? Exactly. You can get a sunburn. What happens if we just make you stay outside all day long? in direct hard sunlight, especially if you naturally have, yes, you've got DNA damage. You can actually literally go to the point where you have blistering, you increase your risk for melanoma, etc. Now think about things like calluses on your hand. If you lift weights a little bit, you do physical work, you're going to build a callus. Your skin gets thicker, you're less likely to injure it. Now what happens if you have to go and keep doing all of that work barehanded without anything to help protect your skin, what can then form on your hand? Bingo. And then you can go from having blisters to then the blisters rip. And now you've got literally open bleeding hands. 
and those bleeding hands increase your risk for illness in, or in otherwise. So when we think about training, yeah, you can always get yourself to be excessively sore, but you need to think about we're applying enough stress that the body has to get better and that we're going to improve our fitness, but not so much that we're literally doing damage to the point at which we're only making it back to where we started in the first place. Hence what's known as a hermetic stressor. Does that make sense to you guys? So this is an example of that type of streaming you're gonna see from really hard training where we've done damage to the muscle fibers. Just like through here, you can see how we've got a little bit of dysfunction through the sarcomeres thanks to really, really hard, heavy training, even more so. Now, when we have set off this inflammatory cascade, we in turn are going to have white blood cells that are gonna move into the area to literally help resolve part of the soreness and otherwise, because that muscle damage is gonna attract their neutrophils. Those in turn are gonna release chemicals and some free radicals, which in turn are going to stimulate our pain receptors. And then these macrophages are going to help with removing the cell debris, AKA the different proteins that are leaking out of our muscles or muscle fibers, so that they're not going to go to our kidneys and literally overwhelm them. And that's where you can talk about renal failure for individuals that go all the way into the really far crazy ends of rhabdomyolysis. So first thing we do is really high tension in the muscle itself, okay? We do damage to the muscle, to its cell membrane, and that's from a group of proteins known as the desmosomes or the glycoprotein uh, or the costumere, which in turn is what's going to literally link your Z lines to your, your cell membranes. That's actually how you produce force is it's translated across the membrane of the cell. Now, this in turn, throwing off your calcium levels, which is gonna have issues with literally just the cellular respiration inside, along with breaking down your own Z-discs. After a couple hours, we're gonna have those neutrophils being migrated to that area, and then the production, the production of histamine, a number of different kinins and potassium are in turn going to be stimulating those nerve endings, and it's gonna be even worse when we're doing lots of eccentric damage. Now, like anything else, this is going to release those intracellular proteins and it's going to increase our total amount of muscle protein turnover. Now, this is going to use a lot of both intra and extracellular components. And we still don't fully understand everything that's in built into both muscle damage and repair. We do understand there's intramuscular signaling to set that up, but as far as how it's exactly fully translated and how that in turn is going to allow for the fibers to be rebuilt in an organized manner is still not fully understood. So go figure, when you're excessively sore, you're also weaker. And there are certain studies where they literally induced so much soreness in these people. It was an elbow flexor study, I believe with uh, mostly women, that they literally had them the next time they came in producing force at only 50% of their initial testing. They were that sore. Now this is gonna become, or because of the muscle is damaged and we don't have the same amount of sarcomeres to produce force. We're not able to recruit those muscles themselves and we're not gonna have as much actin and myosin inside of that cell to do its job. So this is that set example where literally they finished the training session half as strong as they entered. And most of it is caused due to the actual electrochemical coupling failure, AKA we're not doing a good job of actually going through the normal action potential and the physical damage. After notice five days, the physical disruption is effectively taken care of, but now we have issues with contractile protein loss. We're literally breaking down some of that actin and myosin to go ahead and resolve that. And after two weeks, there was still some strength loss due to inability to completely fire the muscles. And it was after a full month that they're still weaker than when they started, but like anything else, they're resolving it. Now, aside from the fact that you guys should be like, okay, I'm never gonna do anything like that to myself in training, but understand that there's a number of people that are like, yeah, I'm gonna go to the gym and I'm just gonna bomb myself out on this side or the other. It's important to meet your body with where you're at. 
you know, ask yourself to get better, you know, give yourself a strength training stimulus that's going to help you improve, but don't go to such lengths to where you're going to literally be causing effectively dysfunction and a diminishment in performance for a significantly long period of time. So when our muscles are really damaged, we actually do a very poor job of replenishing glycogen. And this in turn is going to actually impede how quickly we're gonna resolve the muscle damage. Because like anything else, we can only store so much glycogen, we can only store so much uh, triglycerides inside of our cells. So if we're doing literally too hard of training, it's going to take us too long to recover from the protocols that we're doing. And if you really wanna hit a great peak, you should honestly think about tapering back your really hard training effectively like two weeks before your actual competition. So that way your essential, all of that damage can in theory be mostly completely resolved. So you're going to have maximal performance. Now, a lot of these studies, and that's where you see the kind of the, the chart on the bottom, these are based on doing some straight up fruit loops level of intensity that I would never put upon any of you guys in a logical training program. However, this is earth. And you definitely see some people that aren't exactly training in a very logical manner. And this is part of the reason why, if you're training so hard that you cannot train a body part more than once per week, and it's not because you are like Mr. Olympia size, big and strong, you're probably doing too much per session. And you should divide that work up over more than one session. So you're going to be able to recover faster and in turn, be able to train more frequently. So we want to make sure we're reducing this. You should have some soreness after productive training. It's just a simple fact of life, but you shouldn't be Tyrannosaurus wrecked. And this means we shouldn't be doing a whole lot of eccentrics when we're first starting off in training. We need to build up to where we can tolerate this amount of work. We should start with low intensity exercise and build our way up. If someone decides they wanna come work out with you and they've never worked out before, we're not gonna just throw them in the deep end and see if they can swim or see if they're gonna sink. And you can have the option of just kick them in the teeth initially just so that they can understand that this is how it's going to be and then slowly build them back up. I don't think that's a good long-term strategy because Lord knows most people that get to be excessively sore, they probably don't ever want to work out with you again. Now, one of the craziest things when it comes to exercise physiology is we still don't fully understand muscle cramps. We know they happen. We figure that it's probably due to issues with energy or electrolyte turnover, but we still don't fully understand their mechanisms. Now, this can happen with just about any athlete. This can be during the competition, after, or even when you're resting. Some of you guys might find your back cramping at night when you're laying in bed. It's one of those things, unfortunately, it happens. Now, like anything else, exercise-induced muscle cramps are different than nocturnal cramping. Nocturnal cramping is usually due to electrolyte imbalances. While we're training, this can obviously be due to issues with not just electrolytes, but then neurological effects and most likely energetic effects. Because we think back to the action potential, where we need ATP for the muscle bolt to relax and to pump calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum to allow us to relax. So the first version we have is going to cause from muscle overload slash fatigue. So this is where we've really excited the spindle, muscle spindle. We've don't have that autogenic inhibition from the Golgi tendon organ. And because of that, that overworked muscle is going to effectively keep firing and firing. And I'm sure all of you guys have had that really hard training session that you just went too overboard with and your muscle was just cramping like crazy, even though you were well hydrated and you're making sure you're getting in plenty of electrolytes. Now the electrolyte deficit is going to be something that's definitely happening. Sometimes it's going to seem kind of like heat cramps, which some of you guys have probably experienced once or twice in your life, where if you happen to be out there sweating a lot, doing a lot of physical activity in warmer environments, you effectively have issues with the neuromuscular junction becoming hyperexcitable. So even just a little bit of acetylcholine is gonna be enough to make that contract and you're gonna have a hard time relaxing. So in general, fatigue is going to be best effectively fixed by or for fatigued related cramping from just simply relaxing and then trying to do some stretching. Whereas when it's electrolyte based, now we're talking about situations where we should be making sure we're taking in solutions that have great amounts of electrolytes, potentially doing some massage and ice to get those muscles to relax also, 
but really just trying to get more fluids in. And the funny thing is uh, more recent research has shown that quite possibly the amino acid tyr uh, taurine helps with regulation and normalization of electrolyte or yeah, electrochemical gradients, which in turn is also gonna help with cramping. So I love the fact that the population or the women who make up more than 50% of the population considered a special population, even though they're the majority. I love that. Can you tell this book was written by men? Now, like anything else, men and women can both develop strength. Your average female's peak strength is lower than your average male's. And once again, that's pretty much due to testosterone. Now, muscle size is also due to that hormonal difference. Both genders have the ability to increase muscle mass. Both genders have the ability to increase muscle strength. And so there's really no difference in training men and women. The only key difference that you find between men and women is, and this is based on availability heuristics and a number of the strength coaches that I've worked with, which is your average guy, you need to teach them how to lift the weight correctly because they'll just do the dumbest things you'll ever see possible to try to get the weight up, but they'll attack every weight you give them. Whereas you can have an issue on the opposite side when working with a number of female athletes where they want to make sure that they're 100% confident in their technique before they try to add an extra load to the bar. And now this is running with stereotypes, which is a lot like running with scissors. It's not a great decision. Instead, it's always important to meet people with where they're at. Now, when you're dealing with little kids, you can definitely lift weights as a kid. The key is it's dumb to max out as a kid. The fact that they have junior powerlifting, and by junior, I mean like middle school and otherwise, unless that kid is already through the far side of puberty, there's no point in doing one RM. It's dumb. Let them grow up, let them develop at their own rate. Don't worry about maxing out kids. It's not a great choice. You're not gonna screw up their growth. You're not gonna mess themselves up. But if you have them go too heavy, and what's really interesting is, do you guys know effectively when your risk of injury and specifically like muscular skeletal injury is typically the highest when it comes to your adolescence? When do you guys think that would be developmentally? Egg, okay. Well, actually, Ian, that's exactly correct. Your risk of getting injured as far as from like really heavy resistance training is highest during peak, peak growth height velocity, aka when you're having your growth spurt. So if you're working with an athlete and they're literally going through that period of time when they might be gaining two, three inches in height in a month, you should really cut back and make sure you're not doing super heavy loading because A, all of their anthropometrics are changing, which means their technique's gonna change, which means the movements are gonna feel different, they're more likely to make mistakes. And then second of all, this is where their growth plates are effectively the most fragile. And so hence having them go ultra heavy then is dum 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 dum. And another thing is if you're working with old people, turns out they can still increase in strength and performance all the way up until effectively right before you take the long sleep. Now, here's the thing. Like anything else, just be more conservative with progressions with older individuals because typically they have a number of underlying issues, maybe not necessarily risk factors like blood pressure and otherwise, but typically things like orthopedic issues because they've lived a long life. And the longer you live, the more likely you are to have experienced a number of injuries. So when it comes to training in general, once we get beyond being strong enough, powerful enough, and having great enough endurance for a sport, the amount of energy we're going to have to put in to increase that further is probably not worth our time because we only have 24 hours in a day and you only have so many hours per day that you get to work with somebody. So we want to make sure that we're training the systems they really need to enhance performance and that we're making and keeping track of effectively which variables are going to be specific to the sport we're talking about. And we're actually going to start up and discuss a little bit of this on Monday. Are there any other questions, comments, concerns? Because I have gone a minute over. All right, guys. Well, thank you guys for coming and listening today. Stay safe out there. And I will see you guys on Friday. Have a great day. Bye-bye.